video was supported by an educational grant from Healthmark. Hi, I'm Christina Hopkins. My work is in environmental health and infectious disease. I'm a research manager at Ofsted & Associates, which is a company that specializes in conducting real-world research to support improvements in patient safety and occupational health. And today, I'm talking about Ofsted's drying study. So a few years ago, Ofsted did a study on endoscope drying effectiveness. But why? Well, in our previous studies, we'd observed that scopes were often still filled with water and that even fully reprocessed scopes were frequently contaminated. Now, our work and the work of numerous other research groups over the past 30 years have cast doubt on the effectiveness of traditional endoscope drying methods, and guidelines and standards committees have taken notice. So what we're gonna do in this video today is I'm gonna walk you through the Ofsted drying study, what we found, and why it's important. So as I mentioned, in many of our studies, we found that fully reprocessed endoscopes were both wet and contaminated with microbes. So we designed a study in three hospitals to evaluate different drying protocols and determine whether wet endoscopes harbored more contamination than dry ones. So during this study, we observed reprocessing and drying practices, we inspected endoscope storage cabinets, and we assessed drying and contamination levels on 45 patient-ready endoscopes. And we did that by visually inspecting scopes and by taking samples from microbial cultures and ATP tests. At our first hospital, drying practices involved drip drying, where endoscopes were hung in a cabinet while they were still dripping wet, and then a tech flushed them by reaching way over their heads, squirting a syringe of alcohol into the instrument port, and then allowing it to drain out of the distal end and onto the floor of the cabinet. Now, drying did not include wiping with a towel or using forced air to purge the channels before hanging in the cabinets. This is a problem, and here's why. When the scopes hang in the cabinet, can you see how the universal cords and control handles are positioned horizontally? How is moisture supposed to follow gravity and drip out of there? And when we looked in the cabinets at this first hospital, we noticed along the cabinet bottom that there was yellow residue along that vinyl curtain backdrop, and there were puddles of fluid underneath the scopes that were tinged with yellow. Now, given that these are GI scopes, I'll leave it to you to imagine what that was. At the second hospital, the AERs had actually been programmed to do an alcohol flush and an air purge after HLD. Then the technicians wiped down the scopes with towels that were kept on the technician's shoulder for, as the site said, convenience, reused throughout the day, and then finally laundered. After a quick wipe, the technician actually used an air pistol to blow bursts of air into the ports and channels for about 15 seconds or so. And here's a brief video to give you a sense of what that looked like. Keep an eye on the orange arrows. Yeah, now as you can see, a cloud of droplets shot out of the distal end of the scope, all over the floors, all over the AERs, and all over the technician's feet, every time they dried a scope. And notice that technician's not wearing any shoe covers. After using the air pistol, technicians carried the scopes down the hall, just in their hands, and hung them vertically in a cabinet. Now the team noticed that the cabinets had fans for circulating HEPA filtered air around the scopes, but the fans were unplugged and therefore there was no active air circulation, only passive airflow through those vents on each door. Plus the bottom of these cabinets had blue dust balls in it. So there's that too. The step at the third hospital had actually set up a dedicated drying station on the clean side where they took scopes after they were flushed with alcohol and purged with air in the AER. In the drying station, they wiped down those scopes with clean lint-free towels that were used only once. And then they actually used connectors to hook scope, each scope up um, so that every channel would get dried using pressure-regulated instrument air. And they actually did something I think everybody should do, which is they based their policy of 10 minutes of forced air drying on the results of a study that found that 10 minutes of forced air drying prevented growth of gram-negative bacteria. If you ever find yourself asking, what do we do when discussing practices? It's always a good place to start if you start with the evidence. After drying was complete in that drying station, they brought those endoscopes to the storage area in bins 
and then hung them in their vertical cabinets with fans that circulated HEPA filtered air around the outside of the endoscopes. Now I want to point out that in this hospital, the fans were actually plugged in and running. <laughs> So one way we evaluated drying was by doing visual inspection of the ports and channels using a boroscope, which is a thin camera. And we saw droplets inside scopes that had been stored vertically for more than 24 hours all of the time. And they weren't small droplets either. In fact, sometimes we'd even see rows of droplets that we called strings of pearls that stretched all the way down the channel. And what I'm trying to say here is that these scopes were wet. And this video actually shows what it looks like when you approach droplets with the boroscope. Now, interestingly, you might notice that these droplets are cloudy or white, and we think that they may contain a product called semethicone, which is a non-soluble product used by GI docs to improve their visibility during the procedure. Now, after the team completed boroscope exams, we also assessed dryness using a chemical test strip that is blue when dry and turns pink when it comes into contact with water. So when a swab was passed through a channel or a port that didn't have any droplets, the test strip stayed blue. And if it was passed through where there were droplets present, the paper immediately turned pink. You can see that pretty clearly. And one really cool thing that happened in this study is that the results of our visual inspections and the chemical test strips matched almost all the time. So when we use boroscopes, uh, we detected water or, or observed water in 21 of 45 scopes. And then when we used test strips, the test strips detected water in every scope that had the visible fluid during our boroscope exams, but actually also one additional scope where we hadn't seen any visible droplets. And as you can see here, when we pressed it to the test strip, it definitely turned pink. So we know that there's water in the scope, even though we couldn't see it with the boroscope. And this is really important because what this means is that there are two reliable methods for assessing endoscope dryness that largely agree with each other. We also learned something else by doing both visual inspections and using the indicator strips. So this scope had a visible drop of fluid on the grommet near the instrument port. We thought it could be water, so we tried to use a swab to remove it. And as you can see here, we got it. The droplet is gone. And so when we pressed it on the paper, to our surprise, it tested negative, but it left an oily residue on the test strip. So this made us wonder, what on earth kind of fluid had been on this scope? So we asked facility personnel what it could be, and they said their doctors were using, and get this, cooking oil sprays for lubrication during endoscopy. And they had two kinds stocked, PAM and hy V. <laughs> now both of these have different kinds of oils, flavorings, and problematically, silicone, which means that even if your detergent can get the oils out, you might not be able to get all of that residue out during manual cleaning. Docs were also using a product called Silco Spray to help lubricate their bronx, and this is another silicone containing product. Now, I can't believe I have to point this out, but these are not cleared for medical use. And despite that, according to manufacturers like Olympus, their use is likely widespread. Okay, so now let's look at a comparison of the drying methods at each of these three hospitals. And to remind you, we had the drip dry, the air pistol, and the 10 minute, uh, 10 minute purge sites. So as we look down the rows, you can see that everyone was using alcohol and hanging their scopes vertically. But they used different methods to dry the channels and only one side dried the outsides of the scopes with a clean lint-free towel. So how'd that turn out? Well, at the drip dry and air pistol sites, we detected retained fluid in more than 80% of scopes stored for more than 24 hours. In contrast, we found fluid inside only one scope at the hospital using 10 minutes of forced air. And incidentally, that was actually the scope where we didn't see any droplets, but the test strip detected water. And remember that we were interested in learning whether wet scopes had more microbes than dry scopes? Well, in this study, we found a lot of bugs on scopes at the drip dry site, and even more bugs on the scopes at the air pistol site. But there were only three colonies on scopes at the site that had that robust method. And the cultures from the drip dry and air pistol site grew all kinds of bugs, as you can see on this culture plate, which shows that reprocessing and drying simply just did not eliminate germs as we expected it to.
Now, I have to be clear that the findings weren't all due to how scopes were dried, and we think that other factors may have contributed to the microbial growth that we observed. In fact, this table shows that reprocessing practices at the drip dry and air pistol sites were really poor, with technicians skipping virtually all of the steps or doing them incorrectly. In contrast, technicians at the site doing 10 minutes of forced air drying were also following guidelines for almost all of the other steps. But we discovered that they still had problems because cultures detected a few colonies of Stenotrophomonas maltophilia, which is a waterborne pathogen. This bug is commonly found in hospital tap water, but should be filtered out of the AER rinse water. However, the team noticed that water, uh, the water filters were actually visibly discolored, but site personnel said they weren't due for a replacement based on the manufacturer IFU, which suggested or recommended replacing the filters at either three or six months. But they did point out that their procedural volume had recently increased. So, they decided to replace the filters early, ahead of schedule, based on the culture results. And when they did, they discovered brown sludge and mold in the canisters surrounding the filters. Okay, so that was a lot of material, so let's summarize. Ofsted's multi-site study assessed three drying methods at three hospitals. Drip dry, unregulated air pistol, and 10 minutes of forced air. We also found that 10 minutes of forced air was most effective at drying endoscopes, but that other factors can affect bio burden on fully processed scopes, including things like processing breaches, use of insoluble products like cooking oil sprays or semethicone or silicone containing products, and contaminated AER rinse water. Ultimately, improving drying should be just one part of a robust quality management program. This video is an excerpt from a free one-hour continuing education webinar available on our educational portal. If you'd like to learn more about methods for drying flexible endoscopes and verifying effectiveness, check out our full-length webinar on the endoscope drying imperative. You might also be interested in our webinar on semethicone and other insoluble products, our YouTube video on tools for drying and drying verification, and several papers from Ofsted about drying and the use of insoluble products in endoscopy. And thanks for joining me today. For more information, visit our website or contact us by email at education at ofstedinsights.com. This video is made possible by an educational grant from Healthmark, who provided the boroscopes we used to conduct visual inspections. Please contact Healthmark directly for further information about their systems for visual inspection and drying verification at www.hmark.com. And finally, here is a list of disclaimers that you should review prior to making any changes to device processing practices at your facilities.